All right, guys. We've all seen movies about new love or falling in love. But what's your favorite movie about people making it work? People who, against all odds, reconcile their differences and make it out. So my answer is a little unconventional because, quite frankly, it's not a movie that most people think of as a movie about a couple making it work because it is a movie whose main story is uh, about an affair. Um, It's a movie called Brief Encounter by David Lean. Um, And the movie is about this woman in not a loveless marriage, but, you know, she's got an ordinary life, an ordinary marriage, and she's she's looking for a thrill. Uh, And then she we, we start with her lamentedly staring into the fire. Her husband, Fred, is just reading the paper nearby, completely oblivious uh to the the internal turmoil she's having as she thinks back on this dalliance she had with this uh this man Alec played by Trevor Howard and how she met him and the two of them started going to the movies and they started seeing each other and then uh love starts to blossom between them even though they both know that you know they can't get caught because she's a married woman and uh you know, they have this tumultuous love affair, but then eventually he takes a job in Johannesburg and he has to leave. And when he leaves, there's this long and tortured, passionate goodbye and thinking about what could have been um, and all of that. And, and, and then she's, she's torn apart and she, she thinks about killing herself and finally she comes home. And that's when we return to the framing device uh, of her sitting there by the fire and uh, the husband reading the paper. And this is this is what the movie hinges on for me and why I bring all this up and why I say it's a beautiful movie about a couple making it work and forgiveness, which is there she is staring, you know, to the fireplace, just tortured by all this and, and thinking that her husband is completely oblivious. And then he gets up and he walks over to her and he says to her that he realizes that she's been distant the last couple of weeks. He doesn't specify why. He doesn't say anything specific. He just says to her, and I quote, you've been a long way away. Thank you for coming back to me. And he holds her and she cries. Uh, The reason I I love this and the reason I think it's about forgiveness or anything is is that the movie is not about the affair. The movie is not about that. The movie (laughs) hinges on the fact that she has this and that all of this happens uh, to her. And then Fred gets up and tells her, without so many words like we don't need to talk about this i know and now you know that i know and thank you for coming back i don't care where you were thank you for coming back to me it's the ultimate act of forgiveness he never even asks for an apology and they embrace and it just it always that that ending always hits me so to me that's why uh, something like brief encounter is not a love story about uh, a married woman and some man she's having a fling with. It's a love story between uh, a woman and her husband who get over it and get through it. Okay, so my pick for this is um, maybe it's unconventional as well. I don't know. But uh, I, th- for me, I think one of the most beautiful, well observed movies I've seen about a relationship on the rocks and trying to make it work and all of that is. Um, uh, a Woman Under the Influence by John Cassavetes. I thought uh, when I saw it, it knocked me knocked me right on my ass. It's like two and a half hours long, but it doesn't feel like it. It's about um, a marriage where the wife is dealing with like severe mental problems. This isn't a case of like, oh, well, you know, the husband's bad and we treat her like she's crazy because she's not dealing with it. Well, it's like, no, she's actually like legitimately bipolar and she does crazy things and she's unreliable and the husband loves her so much, but he's a, he just doesn't know how to handle it. He's a, Peter Falk is the husband. Uh, Jenna Rollins is the wife, uh, as usual with Cassavetes. Um, I mean, Falk is a blue collar guy. He doesn't know really how to deal with this. He knows something's wrong. He knows the woman he loves is like slipping away from him and making life so much more difficult for him and the kids. And like, he just wants to love her. And, you know, he comes in to the house and she's with another guy. Like she doesn't even realize that she's married or anything and he, he's like flips out over that but like he it's just and uh, it's like a it's a messy movie it's not conventional and it ends with 
kind of this acceptance of just, well, I love you and I'm going to follow you wherever you go, no matter how hard this is going to be. And um, I haven't seen every Cassavetes movie, but I think uh, it's going to be hard for it to not be my favorite of his movies. I think it's pretty great. And uh, uh, we will be covering it in a year. So uh, (laughs) stay tuned. I'm glad you already know that I am a fan of. I'm glad you remembered. I was about to be like, should we just copy and paste this into the next episode and call it a day? (laughs) Grab your bundle of straw and climb aboard our boat because we're talking 1927 Sunrise, a song of two humans here on You're Missing Out with special guest Chrissy Sire. Our guest today is uh, actually an old film school friend of Tom and I's, currently works as a translator and is, uh, holds the distinction of uh, our guest from furthest away because you are speaking to us right now from, uh, I believe, Norway. Uh, Chrissy Sire joins us to talk about Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans. Hello. I'm assuming, unless things have radically changed, you are still uh, in in Norway right now. Yep, I'm in Norway. Now, just to give folks some timing for us, because I feel like I need to state when we record things now, (laughs) to avoid them sounding unfortunate later, uh, we're recording this uh, the day after uh, Joe Biden is inaugurated as president. It's been a crazy couple weeks. What's the most exciting thing to happen in Norway in the last two weeks? Uh, Joe Biden becoming president. Do you guys not have like excitement like that over there? Is I that... wish we didn't have that this kind of excitement. Yeah, seriously, I was going to ask you guys, <laughs> what is no, up no. with the I don't know third world country <laughs> you're living in? Uh, well, you see, we have a system of government, and that system of government can be easily corrupted by ignorance. So, uh... <laughs> yeah, we actually a fun fact. I didn't think about this. It was like right before Christmas. I didn't think about this till I saw it in the like local news that oh it said we're oh we're getting sun this weekend I was like what and it said in the article hours of sunlight in December hours and I'm not talking days or periods hours of sunlight in December zero so I was like oh I was a little confused because I was going for a walk and I was like, what the, well, what is this? I don't, oh my God, look at the sky. It's so weird. It was the sun. <laughs> so to be clear, the biggest news story here in the States is an attempted insurrection and then the, uh, the inauguration of a new president. And the biggest story over there is the sun might come out. Yeah. I like called <laughs> my friends and like, did you know we didn't get any sunlight? And they were like, what? Oh, so, so. In fairness, when I asked you if you wanted to come on and talk about a film literally called Sunrise, you thought it was science fiction? Yeah. Didn't understand. You're like, it doesn't. No. <laughs> but at least we have free health care. Right, guys? I will, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> look, they can't all be winners is all I'm saying. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad you came on for this. I, I really wanted you to come by. Uh, I was excited to have you talk and excited for our listeners to to meet you especially because uh you know you are uh you are social media averse so this is a you know this is and this is uh is have you done podcasts before no never this is your very first that's very i've got a little bell here i'm gonna ring uh... (laughs) so to start off this conversation before we get into why you think the film matters or why we think the film matters let's talk about why the registry thinks the film matters this is what they had to say Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans, explores the relationship between a farmer, George O'Brien, and his wife, Janet Gaynor, when the farmer's metropolitan mistress, Margaret Livingston, suggests he kill his wife so he can run away with her to the city. Directed by German auteur F.W. Murnau, Sunrise bears the hallmarks of German expressionism and continues the director's tradition of introducing new technical methods of enhancing the storytelling process. Sunrise is perhaps most historically and technologically significant, because it was the first feature film to be released using Fox's Movie Tone sound system, which allowed the film score and sound effects to be synchronized with the moving image by recording the soundtrack as an optical track on the same film that captures the image. Sunrise won multiple Academy Awards, including Best Actress for Janet Gaynor, Best Cinematography, and a Special Academy Award for Unique and Artistic Production, the first and only time that award was ever given. So that's what the registry had to say about uh, Sunrise's Song of Two Humans. Now, I want to start this off, Chrissy. Had you seen the film before we did this episode? Yes. Like 10 years ago. So back in, did you did you watch it? Did we watch it in college? I don't remember what. No, did you we see didn't. It there or you just... But I saw uh, Nosferatu, and then I was like, all right, I'm going to check the rest of this out. 
so I watched it. I I don't mean I don't mean to laugh, but I do like that because of uh, you being a you know a Norwegian speaker, you you make you make it sound so pleasant. Nosferatu. It's yeah. just a nice little upswing at the end there. It's, he sounds adorable then. He sounds yeah. cuddly. I'm sort of struggling with the. Can you say it? Nosferatu? No, Nosferatu. No, I mean, say it like how you would say it. Nosferatu. N- what do you think I'm going to say it? Nosferatu? I mean, it's, it's Nosferatu. Yeah, like that's what I'm struggling with, like the R and stuff. So I'm like, okay, Nosferatu. I don't know. Tom, say Nosferatu. Nosferatu. Uh, there you go. Nosferatu. Yeah, but I, I I don't remember. I really didn't remember anything of it. I just remembered the director. I had seen it um, many years ago. I remember uh, the it was on back when we started college. Um, when we started college, uh, Empire Magazine had put out this list of the 500 greatest films of all time. And uh, Sunrise was one of the oldest films on it. And I knew that it had the the legacy of being the only film to win the other Best Picture Award. Uh, because the first year of the Oscars, they gave out Best pr- uh, Outstanding Production and the Unique and Artistic Achievement. And Sunrise won Unique and Artistic Achievement. So I knew it had that distinction. And, you know, a lot of times when you watch uh, old silent films, you kind of have to watch them from this point of distance where you kind of have to do this thing where you go... Okay, I get why this was a big deal then. But I remember watching it for the first time and just being like, oh, I totally get it. This is great. This is so, wow, this is a knockout. Um, so I'm excited to revisit it uh, now. Uh, which is, you know, I, it, it's such an interesting thing. And, and Chrissy, you're right to bring up Nosferatu because it is so interesting that this is this is a film, this is from FW Renau, this is a filmmaker who had already had uh, great success uh, in his home country, in Germany, and then came over here and managed to I understand of course you know English language cinema is different because it's silent but he was able to to translate into this uh, into into the Hollywood system so well over here with Sunrise and have such great success with it right off the bat I think is a really impressive achievement and it's worth noting speaking of silent horror films um, that the story for this film is adapted by Carl Meyer who also did the screenplay for Cabinet of Dr. Caligari which is another great German horror film. I didn't know that. That makes yeah. sense. Seems like uh, horror was in the minds of Germans in the 20s. <laughs> and in fairness, I mean, this is kind of in its own way, uh, you know, a, a psychological thriller. It's, uh, you know, it's it's a proto-vertigo in some senses. I mean, they, they keep making this movie with, like, Beyonce and Gabrielle <laughs> Union every, every February. <laughs> Obviously, with, uh, you know, 100 years later, somehow uh, much less technically impressive those movies yeah. are. But, uh, you know, hey, you, you can't all beat uh, Germans who smell the fear in the air in Germany in the <laughs> 1920s. Why? Well, was I anything mean, going on at the end of the Weimar Republic? I mean, they'd just been blamed for the entire war, so I don't know. You know, there was some, uh, there was some uh, you know, quirky guy rising <laughs> the, up the ranks of the <laughs> political machinations of uh, Germany at the time. Also, just... To, to, to bring it a little levity to the situation, uh, Sunrise is younger than Kirk Douglas. What? <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, he is 11 years older than Sunrise. Oh, he was. He is. He has since passed. Well, he still is. I mean, he did. His existence wasn't wiped away once he died. No, <laughs> this is true. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. And it does come from the terms. But it is it is kind of a a very, you know, it, there is so much uh, of what. Uh, other directors would later use for psychological thrillers. Uh, Hitchcock would later use. Uh, for, in fact, the film's uh, score features the song that Hitchcock mm-hmm. would later use for Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which is such a weird, such a weird moment. You know, do you ever have that where you're listening to a like you're watching a movie and it uses a song that another movie used, and you kind of feel like you're not allowed to use that? Then? Yep. Yeah. Um, Man of Steel, two thousand and fourteen. They used the uh, something from uh, Lord of the Rings, the blah blah blah. Of, uh, yeah, they used it in the uh, trailers. They also yep. yeah, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, there was also a Comic Con trailer where they used uh, some music from uh, the Thin Red Line. That was a uh, very yeah. effective. Yeah, and it's like no, you. <laughs> I'm not crying because of. Oh okay. shit! Wait, we just we just had this a month ago. Fucking Wonder Woman eighty four used the score from Sunrise, uh, Sunshine. Excuse me, Sunshine. Yeah. 
when she starts flying. And I'm like, wait, what? Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, well, that's, I mean, yeah. I, mean it, I mean, hey, great music, love it. Always, always, always down to bring up sunshine. But uh, did Hans like have a week off or something? Yeah, yeah, it's it's weird. Um, the other film that competes against it is uh, for the Oscar besides Chang is The Crowd, which we've previously covered on our show. David Sims was kind of joining us for that. Uh, King Vidor's film. And what I think is so interesting is that it would be easy because they came out around the same time and because they're both dealing with uh, a man, you know, in a, in a struggling in his relationship and struggling to figure out what his place is in the world. It's easy to compare the two. But when you look at the way that this film is structured... Instead of being specifically the story of uh, Johnny Sims in New York City, that opening kind of tells you, you know, this is a, this song of man and his wife is no place in every place. You would hear it anywhere at any time. For wherever the sun rises and sets in the city's turmoil or under the open sky on the farm, life is much the same, sometimes bitter, sometimes sweet. It's very, the characters are just called man, wife, woman from the city. It's very, very... Um, uh, abstract in in that sense. It's trying to be very, uh, you know, uh, open and vague. So it's more in line with something like Intolerance, the D.W. Griffith film, which um, by the time this episode is out, our episode on that will already be out. But it's 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 more a parable in that sense, I think, than than something that is a literal character piece in the way that something like The Crowd is. Well, it also in many ways, though, like this movie is almost a little more focused a little more character focused in a way because there's not much else to what it's doing where like the crowd has some like sociological stuff and all and like stuff about capitalism and like it kind of has a broader scope where this for as much as it's very sketching characters you you kind of i mean because it's really just them two like we spend yeah. and the entire runtime just with them like from the like the long sequence of him on the boat with her and he regrets it and then they go out and they start rekindling their love and then the boat sinks and it's like it's all just them there's not much cutting away to like the the city girl who's trying to take him away or whatever or the family on the farm who knows he's cheating which is just like i, I love that at the beginning of the movie everyone's just like oh, this fucking guy he's with the girl again <laughs> And it's vague in the, only insofar as it's written and performed almost like like a parable, like a, a literal piece of, 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 like, a literal Christian parable of, you know, there was a man, the man had a son, the one son, it's like, you know, they, they don't, they don't get into, the prodigal son story doesn't get into the weeds of, and the son who went away's name was Bill, and Bill really liked the Packers, and so, like, you don't get into that, it just is, is vague enough, you're right, to project yourself onto it and try and find your place in that which I think is so such an interesting storytelling device that, that well, I was going to say it's hard to imagine one doing, but we just had a movie come out this year with a character whose name in the credits is the protagonist. So I guess you can <laughs> still kind of do that. I mean, it's, and it's, it's fun, you know, because we talk kind of talk about that in the crowd episode of how, like, I mean, they get they have names in that and stuff, but, like, the way the dialogue is just so simple and to the point where, like, you could see them talking, and it's clearly a lot more elaborate what they've been given to say to each other. But, like, the movie itself is just giving you the broad just, like, well, I love you. Okay, uh, well, I'm now now I'm mad. And stuff like that where you don't need to overcomplicate it because it's cause silent movies, you kind of have to bring yourself to it because of that lack of that third dimension. And it's it's interesting, you know, I was thinking about the thing that makes this so impressive. I mean, Murnau was just coming off of his previous film uh, was called The Last Laugh, which starred Emil Jannings. And what's so interesting about The Last Laugh is he's already trying to play with form because his goal was to make a movie where you had almost no title cards. Um, you know, it was a silent, no, almost no title cards. And in fact, if I remember correctly in The Last Laugh, and it's been a while, I think there's maybe like two or three total in the entire runtime of this feature. And one of them is only that when the character is about to die in the freezing cold, the title card comes up and says, uh, you know, something akin to, in the real world, this is where this story would stop. There would be nothing else. But because it's a movie, uh, we're going to give him a happier ending. And he ends up inheriting a bunch of money and, and, and living, you know, the happy life. It's It's so 
compelling to see that even in that, like, Murnau is really trying to play with the form while still understanding this is a film. It doesn't need to be realism. And this is so much playing with the form. It's it's not as though anyone behaves... Nobody behaves in a way that you would go, oh, of course, this is naturally, realistically how a person would behave, but it conveys the emotion of the moment better than, I think, trying to tell the story realistically could. Don't want to cut off that uh, wonderful point, because the point stands, the point's good, he's making some good arguments here. Uh, but The Last Laugh wasn't the movie he made before Sunrise, he's it was not. Faust. Okay. Faust, did he finish Faust? I mean... Yeah. Yes. Okay, you're you're correct. Last Laugh was preceded that, right? No, it preceded Tartuffe. Jesus, I'm missing a bunch here. Okay. Nevertheless. Uh... Uh, well, I mean, uh, you know, you, you, obviously two main creatives you have to talk about when you're talking about this movie. Uh, it's Murnau and um, the writer. What's the writer's name again? I forgot his name. Uh, Cal- the Cal- writer is Carl Meyer. Okay, so you, th- those are kind of the two main figures you're going to end up talking about with this movie. I think murnau has got such a fascinating trajectory that I you know, I kind of want to talk about because he doesn't have any other movies, on, uh, unless I'm mistaken, because he only made like three movies after this, and this was his first American movie. So it's interesting, yeah. Uh, the one, so what I'm thinking of when I said uh, is that I think Four Devils is the one that's, that's non-existent. The one he makes after this is, is gone. No one, there's, there's, uh, apparently the only surviving print, uh, belonged to Mary Duncan, but she lost it. Uh, and then after that is City Girl. You know, I lose prints all the time. It's easy to lose, (laughs) it's easy to lose a film print. So I, you know, I, I, I I get it. You know, I, you you cannot blame Mary Duncan for just losing an entire film (laughs) in four reels of her prints, you know? Easy to do. Sometimes I lose my cell phone. Sometimes I lose a film print. I, you know, if I looked under my my couch right now, boom, Ambersons right there. You know, it's it's uh, uh fans of the show are gonna be excited. It's their favorite segment. Tom defends actress Mary Duncan. It's a recurring, <laughs> it's a recurring uh, segment here. But you know, it's it's funny you talk about a lost film, and that's what I was kind of going to get at in that. Uh, you know, this is his first English film, and he made a few uh, German films before coming over. Uh, the most famous being Nosferatu. Um, but that movie was like a day away from being lost forever because he straight they straight up just plagiarized Dracula. Bram Stoker's wife sued the shit out of them. The court said, yes, this is plagiarism. You didn't pay her. All film prints of Nosferatu must now be destroyed. But because one print managed to get to America, and in America they were able to hide it, was the only way Nosferatu was able to survive. So what would his, uh, I don't know, career look like if Nosferatu just got wiped away from there? What would cinema look like if Nosferatu was just literally wiped away from the earth? You mentioned the other films he made, and yes, so he makes Four Devils, which has gone missing. Mary Duncan lost it. And then he made City Girl, which stars Mary Duncan. And then his final film was a collaboration called Taboo, a story of the South Seas, where he teamed up with Robert J. Flaherty, who uh, our episode on Nook of the North has dropped the day we're recording this. Robert Flaherty, who made Nook of the North, teamed up with FW now on Taboo, but Flaherty left the project early on, and then Murnau would die a week before Taboo's premiere in 1931 yep. uh, in an automobile accident. So, oh, how convenient. Yeah. yeah. Conven- are you suggesting that Robert Flaherty murdered F.W. Murnau? I Is mean, that what you're implying? After now? just watching... <laughs> American news for too long. Yeah, Nothing right. will surprise me. Look, it's not. I mean, <laughs> Chrissy, in, it's not like people just casually commit murder on a whim. This isn't Sunrise, a song of two humans, uh, which is where we should get into that. Pre- pretty just casual suggestion of murder <laughs> that has then just been like, yeah, you know what? Yeah, you know, I didn't think of that. Yeah, I think I'm. I think yep, I'm yep, just yep. gonna do that. I have a theory. <laughs> oh boy. I <laughs> is it, are I sent, we about to go into a Jacob's Lattice scenario? No, no. <laughs> I I have a theory, and I sent it to Mike earlier, just to like get the lay of the land. 
And uh, I, th- I think I'm good. Okay. <clears throat> so 1922, Murnau makes Nosferatu. Germany is in a crisis. And Nosferatu is, I mean, uh, Murnau is sort of high on that like German expressionism wave. So he makes Sunrise, a song of two humans. All right? In you this economy? <laughs> yep. Okay, just listen up. Because I was watching it. I, um, uh, I mean, I totally bought the film and watched it legally. So I was making some notes. And I didn't realize this until after I was done watching it. Like, okay. So just listen up. The woman from the city which is her only name, is straight up a vampire. Let that sink in. And I have examples. Are you ready? <laughs> sure. I need an affirmative or something. Yep. But go By all means. The floor yeah. is yours. Okay, so riddle me this. She only shows up during nighttime. Like the first, the first ever scenes. She's like whistling ominously outside some guy's window. But the window is behind him, and the door is, like, all the way over there. So she, like, whistles ominously, and he's like, oh, my God, the dark forces. I, I, oh, I have to go. I have to go right now. So he goes. And the woman from the city wears all black, and she seduces the man really fast. And in the beginning, I was like, okay, that's not enough, even if that's your, like, gut feeling. But then... I mean, just rewatch the way she holds him. He doesn't hold her when they kiss. And mind you, this was a hundred years ago. So there were no like, oh, uh, gender roles. It's just a construct and you can do whatever you want. Blah, blah, blah. Exempt. I mean, right? She holds him. <laughs> just like a vampire would hold its prey. Or it's, uh, I don't know, familiar, that's witches, but still. She holds him, okay? And how she is seemingly able to mind control the man, because she's like, oh, uh, we should be together. And he's like, yes. And she's like, oh, you should drown your wife. And he's like, "Uh, no. But then, yes. He totally agrees with that, like, suddenly. And (laughs) you have that, like, juxtaposition i don't know if i'm saying that right of her like towering over him just her like around his neck area if if that's not suspicious i don't know and then you have like these bells that i i guess they're wedding bells but he they sort of like they show up in the beginning and then they're there in the middle when they make up when he makes up with his wife but it's sort of ominous Don't you think? Uh, If you guys want to hear more of uh, Chrissy's theories, you can read them on her blog, QAnon, the Norwegian conspiracy. No, no. (laughs) We did did book the Norwegian Alex Jones. We should warn our listeners now. Um, But I'm not done. Oh, boy. And in the end, when, uh, well, first, there's a scene where the boat goes down in the thunderstorm, and it's like, oh, very dramatic. But then in the scene where we see the man, when he has survived, we see the moonlight. That's when she emerges. And she's like awake, just circling, like ominous shit. I don't know. But when she hears the news that, oh my god, some blonde chick, which is totally not me, because I'm the complete opposite of darkness. When she hears about that, she's suddenly up in a tree. How in the happy hell... Did she get up in that tree? She's supposed to be a lady from 100 years ago, right? And we, and we know women do not have upper body strength. <laughs> True. So how in the happy hell did she get up there? Why is she up in the tree and not on the ground like a normal person? All right. <laughs> Thank you. I'm done. Please discuss. So it, her entire <laughs> argument is just the Richard Pryor Dracula sketch. Hey, man, what you doing looking at that window? <laughs> so when when we uh, tell folks who are coming on the show, we always say the important thing is that you come on with your take of why this film matters. And the, the importance is to get different points of view. And I, I have to say this, um, this Backfired. takes the cake. No, this this takes the cake for 
absolutely the most unique take on a film yet. No one else has come in on one of these movies and been like, throw out everything you've thought about this film. <laughs> I have a take. Sure, 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 sure. It could be a parable about jealousy, lust, and forgiveness. But on the other hand, look How at it. How did she different. get up in that tree? Listen, that was all totally know, unnecessary. There was no need for her to be sitting in a tree listening to other people talk. Listen, Germans Truly. can only make one kind of movie, and F.W. Renau was only able to make every single human being in his movie a vampire. Or those that are being hunted and preyed upon by vampire. I like that under Tom's premise, Chrissy believes that every German film is a vampire movie. And just, no, no, no. You know, not that every German film, but just every German filmmaker can only do one kind of thing. So uh -uh. Renau made Nosferatu, and so everything else, it, that is his Rosetta Stone. You need to look at every movie <laughs> as in, which one is the vampire, the one that walks <laughs> among us, the dead, and, w and who amongst them are the prey. It's wow, very Tom, simple. You sound kind of angry. <laughs> I, I, don't, you know, I don't sound angry. This is just how I am. I'm just imagining I'm imagining sitting next to Chrissy during a screening of Metropolis and her going, You know that robot? Vampire. <laughs> Secretly a vampire robot. No, but that's that's not just like a stupid theory that I just pulled out. Because I was watching it and then in the beginning I was like, Oh, how ironic. The full moon. That's weird. Why is she holding like a 200 pound farm boy like that? Like a baby? What's, what is she doing to his neck? Why is there like this dark shadow over him all the time? Why is he suddenly slumping down to like impossible standards? What the hell is going on? Huh. He seems kind of possessed. That's weird. Who could do that? The Moonlight Lady? Maybe. I don't know. And then you have the light. And this is purely from using the, the internet machine. The the actor, what, what was her name? Janet. Janet, the, the wife? Janet Gaynor. Yeah. Janet Gaynor. She originally has like long flowing white hair. But in the movie, no, I mean red hair. In the movie, she was forced to wear a wig, a blonde wig. And the, the audience, they were pissed because they were used to seeing her long hair. But she was wearing blonde wig. Blonde versus black hair. The darkness versus the light. And you really can't trust any woman that changes her hair color. That's very shifty. No, truly. <laughs> no, but I thought I thought that was interesting. I'm just, I'm not like. <laughs> I, I, I do agree with you insofar as there is some credence to the fact that, again, there is an unreality to this film. And there is a, the woman from the city is not a three-dimensional character. She is definitely a, uh, a a temptress type character. She is certainly something outside of reality. She is something that exists to disrupt the reality of the man and wife. I mean, I guess it's a better take on the movie than uh, all city women are just dirt-ass hoes. <laughs> <laughs> I... I gotta, I gotta say, I, I love the fact, truthfully, and we will get into the more serious film discussion before our audience revolts. But, but I, I do have to uh, appreciate the fact that I, I did kind of go, you know, hey, you know, to you before, and I'm like, hey, are you comfortable doing the show? Are you comfortable being on mic? And, and secretly, you were sitting there going, I'm going to be this show's chaos agent. <laughs> I, 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 like before we record, you're like, I've been listening to the episodes, and really, you were just looking for the weak point that you could just. <laughs> Come in, hit a point, and we would just both be be speechless for a few minutes. Yes, but I I still agree with them because I mean when the the woman I mean the vampire from the city walked in to these like strangers' houses and she just buffed her shoes, I was like, oh, you're a slut, you are a slut because you're showing your ankles. <laughs> That was that was 1927. No, but here's the thing that I think is interesting, and this is the thing I really love in this movie. Truthfully, if we can talk about a shot for a moment. Uh, and you're right. You're right about it being creepy. I mean, when he's walking to go see her, he's walking through that very foggy farmland, and you're right, there's the full moon. My favorite thing about the moon, though, uh, and the way that it's used, is that the Murnau understands how we watch a shot and how we process images. And so when you have the scene where he's going to meet her, uh, you have a, a wide shot. Uh, the woman in the city 
is on the right side of the frame, right? I believe the right side of the she's on she's on one side of the frame, and the moon is dead center, as though it's acting as a divide, and there's that empty space, and then the man enters the empty space, so your brain is already doing the math of, like, right, that's her side, that's his side, it's divided by this moon. So when when she crosses that divide, you naturally just feel this shudder of like she violated the space you know oh. it's it's like when you nowadays you know when you break the the 180 degree rule that we were told about in every class for four years <laughs> when you break that it's jarring and in the same way you're when she crosses over when she crosses under that moon into his space it it is it's jarring it's it's yep. telling you something's wrong uh i think that there's some great things of you know, and even the way that he's playing with the the way that cinema, the way that when uh, when there's the title card and she says, "Couldn't she get drowned?" The way that the card melts, like you don't see that. No, nope. like, you know, play, playing with the form that way, I think, is so interesting. Yeah, but I think that's uh, part of the reason why it's so popular. I'm not gonna say popular, but why it's so revered. Oh no, the now... TikTok kids love "Sunrise: A Song to Humans." <clears throat> Oh, God. It's that in sea shanties. The TikTok kids are all over it. <laughs> but right. it was it was kind of the first uh, doing a lot of things. I mean, the, the set, it was all set. They yeah. weren't outside. It was all set. So just sort of the budget of that film and the way that Murnau uses the camera to portray a feeling without the talking cards or whatever. So, I mean, you you really feel something about the I guess the man and the wife yeah. during the film and that's sort of amazing even now without speaking and it's you know when you talk about the techniques I mean the fact that that opening shot of the train station mm. uh, was all forced perspective uh, you know it was it was multiple layers and they used uh, um, you know uh, they used short people uh, or, or little people whatever the proper term is, are these little people to stand in as as people walking in the background so it looked like they were further away, used a model train up close to the camera, which is the same kind of techniques they used in the film we just recorded our last episode on, which is Casablanca for the plane. Um, so Murnau is already, you know, in 27, playing with the tricks they would be using for decades to come. Uh, and at the same time, to talk about innovation, you know, as as the statement from the registry mentioned, they used uh, the soundtrack, the idea of this sync sound soundtrack. Mm. Nobody's talking, you know. That would that you know, that that would come with the jazz singer, which is around the same time. But but it's still using a synced audio track, recognizing how you could use certain sounds to evoke an emotion out of the audience. Absolutely. And uh, and you're right about the sets too, because they. Uh, that was I was I have a note here that the the really stylized sets were were done to create kind of a fairy tale setting. So it's not meant to be realistic. It's not meant to be taken literally. Uh, and that apparently the city street got reused constantly, uh, including in a John Ford film called Four Sons the following year. Hmm. Well, I can imagine it cost a lot of money. So yeah. why not? Got to keep using it. That's like we talked about in our Gone with the Wind episode. Uh, I don't know when the last time was you watched uh, watched Gone with the Wind, but uh, when Atlanta is burning down, they're literally burning down old MGM sets. They literally just they they set fire to old MGM sets. If you watch the shot where Rhett and Scarlett are in the carriage, uh, in like very small in the foreground, and there's a big tall building that collapses, that's the gate that King Kong walked through in King Kong. They just <laughs> torched it to the ground. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. There's, and apparently a lot of the contemporary purists when this film came out hated those kind of things. There were a lot of people complaining about the way that he messed with the title cards or, or some of the techniques he was using. So uh, it's 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 really honestly amazing. Just since the beginning of film, there's been fucking jerk offs that are like, oh, cinema has to be this thing. You can't do anything different. F. W. Manow, how dare you? And it's like. Motherfucker, cinema's been around for like 10 years. Enough. <laughs> Movies have been like a real thing that's like an artistic en endeavor for like 10 years. Like, relax. 
<laughs> but there is, I mean, there is this element, and you can read it even in criticism of the time, about like, oh, movies should only portray things as they really are. They should only be, uh, you know, a literal one-to-one of like how people behave. You know, it should, uh, like, uh, Tom has lately taken to Twitter, and anytime people have their, um, you know, put their scholar glasses on and, and try and have the discourse about it, about like a kids' film or a superhero movie, and just Tom's comment is always, "I'm sorry, it was not an Italian neorealist film," <laughs> and it's it's true. Like, there's so much in this, yeah. Sure, we could get literal about, you know, oh, well, it's he, he tries to kill his wife and then she just forgives him real quick. But because it's not really about murder, it's a story about forgiveness. From the guy who gave us, you know, the super grounded movie called Nosferatu. Uh, uh, <clears throat> wait, wait, Chrissy, is this where you're going to expand on this and tell us that vampires are 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 real? Is that your next? Is that your next no, pitch? The way you interrupt there? They're not real, unfortunately. <laughs> but I, uh, a thing I sort of struggled with when I watched it again was not uh, like putting my own subjective feelings into the movie. Because I mean, besides all the oh, she's definitely a vampire. You can't tell me otherwise. <laughs> part i was like well of course the husband is bored with the wife because she's taking care of the kid she's making dinner that's not very interesting and when that uh um sorry uh city girl pulls up her like ankles and shows us that she's a slut i'm like oh well of course she has shaved legs when was the last time the wife shaved her legs Never, because she was busy giving birth to kids. Back before the them. Kaiser got shot down. <laughs> and, like, taking care of them. And, I mean, normal day-to-day life, especially with kids, is not very interesting. It's not interesting at all. So, of course, the husband, who's, like, just there, I guess, being fed and... The wife is raising his kids and he's like, oh, I'm so bored. No wonder I'm not doing anything. Of course, he's interested in the city girl who's like outside whistling ominously outside his window with her shaved legs and everything. So I just feel like I put my own subjective feelings into it. And I I sort of understand him in the beginning, except the murder part where he's like, this is much more interesting than the stew that my stupid wife is making. You know, I, I I have two thoughts. One, I just want to address up front that you just said the statement. There's nothing very interesting about raising kids. And I, I, I assume your kid is too young to be subscribed to this show, right? He will not be hearing this. Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> My step. Your step kid. True, that's true. I should point out. But yes, that. But I think you have to with this. You, you, you know, this is a kind of film, especially this kind of film, where you have to bring your own personal perspective to it. You have to map parts of yourself onto it you know i I think that when it comes to viewing art of any kind whether it's you know film uh, music otherwise of course the personal stuff gets factored in i think what you have to be able to do when it comes to talking about these things and something we've maybe lost the thread of uh in the film twitter world is that you need to be able to access a part of yourself to access so you need to be able to connect to it but just because it doesn't reflect you and your own life or your own experiences does not make it bad it's you have to find the way to connect this and, and and relate to it so like you were pointing out you know you were able to bring something subjective to it and and look at it and understand the vantage point where these characters are coming from and hopefully with films like this that are you know very moving and very evocative you come away from it feeling like you went on a journey i mean i think to a t that's what this film does it's all about just taking the audience on a on a i think you know it, it comes from a a more european tradition where Things are a bit more expressionist. They are a bit more abstract. I think about, um, you know, when you watch a lot of I- Italian theater, for example, particularly, you know, you, you look at that and, and and the traditions that it carries on, there's not a real sense of, of realism in a lot of cases. You're watching things that obviously you have to suspend your disbelief and just latch on to. Uh, you know, we all know Roberto Benigni is not a 10-year-old boy puppet, you know, to, to, to bring him into it. Um, okay, I, I was gonna say I'm glad you know that. Yeah, I'm I'm aware. Uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't sure if you 
really didn't know that yet. No, I believe that not only is that meant to be taken literally, but it's a cinematic universe shared with the new Pinocchio. Old Pinocchio from 2002 grew up to become the Geppetto in the new Italian Pinocchio, which me, <laughs> me and five other people have seen. So can I can I address one thing that I loved um, in this movie? And look, I want to talk about a lot of things. And I want to talk about the emotional things in this movie. Uh, I want to talk about the, the moving things in this movie. However, I do also want to uh, address something that I think, you know, we talk a lot about what movies do or don't do now, right? And how movies should do more of something. Oh, they don't do it like this anymore. Um, you know, and I, I think one thing that this film does that so many movies today don't do is there are not enough drunk pigs in movies today. Yeah, what was that? Why Why was the... Oh, well, that was a... In, a, in America, we have something called pigs. They're an animal, Chrissy, you see. Oh, there. yeah, I know. But wh <laughs> what was that, like, tossing of the balls and you release a pig? Was that the prize? Were it's, they it's being so, punished? I don't know. No, it, pig races are a thing that happened out here a lot. Uh, they're kind of a thing that happens still at, like, country fairs and things like that. This is a real thing. Pig races. You just, like, they have these pigs and they make them run and you kind of, like, you cheer on which pig you're rooting for. Yeah, but um, the pig, we're not racing. Well, that pig got away. Yeah, it's, it's a thing. The pigs are incorporated into these fairs is what I'm getting at. I don't have a defense for it. It's just we were starved for entertainment back then. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Well, just goes to show you what F.W. Monroe feels about Americans just I don't know, the fucking watching pigs doing shit? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In fairness, though, that the drunk pig is a delight. It is a delight. Also, could absolutely be deleted from this movie. Yeah, yeah. sure. But that's the thing. I think the thing that's, that I like about this film a lot is the fact that it's rewriting the rules. It's doing something different as opposed to... And we talked about the purists back then not liking it, but now, like, if you made this movie today, it would be a two and a half hour long movie because we would have had to, because the rules say we would have had to spend an hour establishing the husband and wife's romance, and then we would have had to spend time showing his slow descent into cheating because otherwise the audience isn't going to buy it because XYZ. And this movie foregoes all of that and just kind of goes, I'm going to take you on a 90 minute ride. Don't think about it. Just feel it. And it, you know, I, I, I do question whether that's possible, you know, now, if we've gotten so far away, if we've established such rigid rules for what you can and can't do, where, you know, and I don't mean that in, like, I don't mean can and can't in a cancel culture way. I mean specifically, like, now in film criticism, there's so much, how many people make a career on YouTube going, here's everything wrong with this movie, because the rules say you can't have a character say this before they say this. And it's like, this, this flouts... All, this throws all of that out, and, uh, you know, I mean, and in effect, by doing that, kind of has the freedom to do what it wants, and, and it allows you to, it can alternate between something that's meant to be just, you know, sincere and literal, and also have a lot of expressionist uh, images in it, because since it sets up that unreality from the start, you are more receptive to when the husband, you know, when husband and wife are walking and you have the, uh, the the front projection in front of them walking through the city and then the cars or them laying back and looking at their future above them in the sky. You can have those moments and they're not jarring because the film just tells you from the beginning, just go with it. Yeah, but do you feel that that was how people, that was people's perception like almost 100 years ago? Or do you feel like since we spent a lot of money on our degrees, we're able to put on our like special hats for the uh, like yeah, discussing a movie that was so old. But I mean, somebody said it's important, so now we think so too. I I mean, we have in the past in the show pushed back on on this this uh, instinct some people have sometimes to to kind of, and I'm not saying you're doing this specifically, but like to kind of think like, well, in the past maybe they were dumber. Uh, because if anything, no, I'm not, uh, no, I'm not saying dumber. Yeah. No, I'm not saying you are, but I'm saying it's more a thing of. I think that when this film came out, uh, yeah, I mean, again, there were contemporary critics saying that's not how you do film, but I, I think because the medium was still so new, but one, I think people were more open to stuff doing something different. Um, I don't think they had gotten so set in their ways about what a movie is, quote unquote, supposed to be. You know, we didn't even, if you look at old movie magazines uh, and you read how they write about these films that are coming out, you know, Hell's Hinges or whatever, 
they really don't even try to put them in the same tight genre boxes that we do now. I think there's a lot more openness to, and it was also something that was not treated the way we treat it now. You know, back then, you know, when you once we got into the age of features, uh, you know, once once you have that with the D.W. Griffith films and then King Vidor and all that, people tend to talk about it, at least from what I've read, talk about it like going to the theater. You know, that it was more about it was less a consumer product and more something where you went and you you were open to what this is going to be and 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 what it could be. I mean, there was there was so many more possibilities to it in the same way that I think the only comparison and it's not a one to one. But I think that now when people pick up a, a video game, for example, yeah, there are the people who go and they just want to play a sports game or a shoot 'em up. But there is this idea now, especially in that indie world, of these can be anything. I, I, there's the, the rules are trying to get flouted. Where I've, and I'm not a big video game player by any means, but I feel like every every other month I'm hearing about something where it's like, oh, you got to try this game. You you play as a flag. Okay, what does the flag do? It just sways around. Okay, and then in this one, you know, you're a feather, and in this one, well, you're walking through a graveyard, and it's just you. Like, there's so much where it's like where all the rules are out, there's this big audience for, yeah, I want to see something weird. I want to try something different. I'm open to a new experience. And I think that if you look at the way people received films then, while of course there were the ideas of this is a comedy, this is an adventure, this is this, there is a lot more flexibility in terms of like, yeah, try this. Let's see if this works. Sure. Which, you know, and and the audience, at least to, to more of a degree than they would now, show up for that. Well, yeah. But still, I, I feel like there's... It's... Well, I, I, of course it's hard to put myself in the shoes of a farmer from 1927. But I still feel like once there was a new like motion picture out or the the before the talkies even there was like okay there's this new movie i don't know what's it what what's it about i don't know but it's an evening away away from my sad life i'm just gonna sit here and i'm gonna watch it i'm gonna put in my best clothes and yeah let's go you know so I feel like yeah. we at, at this point in time we put a lot more meaning into something that was sort of just a distraction from the post-war feeling. You know? I mean, I agree with you there, but I all I think that it was more I don't think that necessarily the people were going to this and and taking notes like we are going, well, the net that he walks past symbolizes his own entrapment and his own yeah. I don't know if it was that, but I think that what that was meant for and what that really does is it's the same thing as it's the same thing as if you listen to uh, if you listen to a Bob Dylan song or a Joni Mitchell song or a Patti Smith song where there's these very evocative images in the lyrics. And if you sit down and break it down, you can sit down and go, oh, this is what Dylan meant when he said this because this is referring to this. But when you're actually listening to it, even though you're not doing that in real time, the emotion of it and the meaning of it still gets to you. So I think that even though nobody was sitting there, or not many people were sitting there in the audience going, oh, the way that she crosses underneath the moon is like <laughs> her going through a barrier that was created by our subconscious, but they felt it. And I think yeah. that it is the it is about the openness to letting yourself feel something and respond to art in a visceral way without having to rationalize it and codify it the way that now when we talk about film there is always this impulse when you're watching a movie uh to think okay well how why do i like this let me see if i can break it down into specific things because if i say on twitter that i liked it and uh i can't explain and define exactly why i liked it then people are going to tell me that I shouldn't like it. And it's like, when you go to see one of these kind of films, you just you just feel it. You just let it happen. I mean, that's that's at least my... my th and that's the thing with... Even with the, the fact that it's not about... It's a movie about forgiveness, but it's not a movie about forgiveness in the way that like we think of it now or in the way that movies would be uh, in, 
in the future where forgiveness is something where it's like where it's a transactional thing um where now when we talk about forgiveness um we talk about it like a jet a get out of jail free card right yep. where if you say i'm sorry uh i'm sorry means you can't be mad at me anymore and if you don't accept my i'm sorry then tell me the tasks that i have to achieve to make you not mad anymore and then once i achieve those tasks you can't be mad anymore whereas this is about forgiveness in the way that I think is more often the case in uh, especially long-term relationships, which is forgiveness in the sense of the world is chaos and we're just emotional objects tossed around in it. Let's just try and get through it. Yeah. I completely uh, agree with that. Cause um, I mean, when I, when I saw it, I was like, okay, but what has the husband done? Has he saved her from anything? Has he, does he have any redeeming qualities at all he doesn't at least that we don't see but we're sort of invited into their relationship we don't know a lot about it and it doesn't show us anything about it except that the wife is like really forgiving but usually there would be some kind of like redeeming qualities or he saved her from a bus or whatever he saved her generally but here it's like Okay, but the wife forgives him, and we just have to accept that because that's exactly how a long term relationship is. It yeah. may look crazy from the outside, but on the inside, you don't really know. Yeah, it's, it's, I think that we, you know, and I, I this came up when we were talking about when on our Gone with the Wind episode, and we were talking about the very complicated staircase scene, and I kind of went, we forget that human sexuality is complicated. I think that with people, we forget that human emotions are complicated and, and trying to be people together is complicated. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't think that if you went to FW Renau and said, hey, uh, my friend's husband tried to murder her. Should she forgive him five minutes later? He would go, yeah, of course. I literally meant this as I depicted it. It's more doing something very broad to convey, uh, you know, a more complicated and nuanced emotion. Well, I think that's kind of a thing we've kind of lost in movies these days in that they don't, they aren't like an exact one-to-one -one replica of real life. Like we're yeah. dealing with, I mean, depending on the story you're telling, it's either fucking like uh, one of Linklater's before movies where it's like set overnight or set straight up an hour and a half. Sometimes you tell a story about uh, like like uh, the crowd where it's like, oh, this is like a story set over like 10 years uh, it's you're, you're dealing. You have to deal with the compression of time, and thus you're dealing with the compression of emotions. And people, at least at this time, because it felt like people kind of must have understood. Like, well, wait, okay, so this isn't real, so we can accept like things that aren't real. Because, like we said, this guy made Nosferatu. Yeah, uh, Phantom of the Opera had come out two years before, so Universal was starting to get into the horror movie thing. Like, people were able to understand that necessarily things we're seeing isn't how it's going to exactly be but the truths that they're getting at because it, it, it still does paint in like okay so we kind of see them at the beginning of their relationship and they're happy and then we cut ahead and this guy's now being preyed upon by the succubus from the city excuse me the vampire from the city vampire and but then seeing his regret and how he really is like conflicted and he doesn't want to kill her. And then he, he does like it. He wakes up to what nonsense is going on in his heart. And then they spend the day together and you see, oh, they do love each other. There is love there. So you can kind of just accept like, OK, we've compressed all of that time. We jumped over from happy marriage to vampire attack and we can now go, okay, the movies now ex has making us say, do you accept the the compression of time we're, we're putting forth to you? And, you know, I, people did at the time, and, you know, people do now if they watch it. I mean, I mean, I th although, although I think, like we've mentioned before, like, only us uh, film school folk would ever actually go back and watch a silent movie and kind of accept it and just be like, yeah. This is great because No, uh, Tom, you don't you don't realize BuzzFeed's already published an article of I watched Sunrise Song of Two Humans for the first time and geez. It's uh you know I watched Sunrise of Two Humans <laughs> and yuck. 
what they would look like if they were cement mixers. Why do you trust BuzzFeed? I mean, come on. Yeah, I I, I do kind of understand where Chrissy's coming from of like, I do have to remind myself. I'll, I mean, I don't have to remind myself anymore. I kind of just in like ingested it. But like, we do need to remind ourselves sometimes, like, not everybody watches movies like we do. For sure. I, I think the thing is, it's a matter of like, I I think, you know, and this this came up, Chris, you just, you know, this came up because the the description that the registry gave for the searchers was very weird because it was like, maybe people at the time didn't understand what it was trying to say. And I'm like, that's a weird assumption. I think with this, <laughs> like, it just like, why are you saying that? With this, it's a it's a thing of I think that, you know, again, it's out films weirdly when you get into this era of silent films and a lot of it is because it's i i honestly it's pre-code movies in general uh often are tackling more complicated ideas than the films obviously postcode but you know there's 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 a lot more to it i mean the crowd have you seen the crowd chrissy yeah it's i'm yeah, lucky you it's hard to find over here uh it's a night uh, great. I mean, another one that's great and it's very complicated. And it's very, it's asking a lot of its viewers, and I can't help but think, and I don't hate this film, uh, the film I'm about to invoke, even though it stars uh, an actor that Tom has no patience for. Um, but to go from a movie like this, um, you know, Sunrise: A Song of Two Humans, and to realize this was, you know, well, the great film of our time about, you know, the complicated aspects of a relationship and then to think about the movie that was the biggest you know one of the biggest hits of the year i think it's the biggest hit of its year uh love story <sighs> which is famous you know the ryan o'neill film which is famous for the quote love means never having to say you're sorry which setting aside the fact that, that line makes no sense when it's thought about for more than a second it's uh, what does that mean are you saying that you should never make a mistake or does it mean that you shouldn't apologize i don't know what that's getting at that's the, the the romance film equivalent of Vin Diesel saying the thing about street fights is the street always wins in that Fast and Furious movie. <laughs> like, it sounds good, and then you try and interrogate and go, what does that mean? But think about that. Think about how big a hit Love Story was in its day. Uh, I think it was the top grossing film of its year. It's on the cover of, I think, Time Magazine saying, this is going to make Hollywood happy again, which was at the start of the 70s, so that prediction didn't quite pan out. Th- imagine going from this movie that basically goes... Look, the thing about relationships is they're very complicated. It's very tough, and forgiveness is not a a uh, is not absolution, but forgiveness is how we get through this nightmare. And then jump ahead to, no, love means never having to say you're sorry. Like what a watering down of a complicated thing. Love means accepting me at my worst. Because if you can't accept <laughs> me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. Shut that is bullshit. <laughs> But I still feel like if we're we're talking about relationships, like when they were in the city and they were having so much fun and using all their money, I was like, well, of course, we're not, they're not showing them back at the farm like, oh, I got to feed the baby again. I don't know. Am I pregnant? I don't fucking know. But they show them in the city just... Spending their money, ruining statues, having pictures taken, and just like, I don't know, plugging up traffic. I don't know. But the thing I thought was like, well, yeah, of course they're having fun. Their baby is across the water. They're spending all of their hard-earned farmer money on stupid shit. So I was like, yeah. I could still be fun if I didn't have a kid to, like, he has to do his stupid homework and all that shit. But don't you think that's a little bit of, uh, also, just so you know, we're going to isolate that clip of you saying, uh, I could still have fun if I just didn't have a kid and shit, and we're just going like, <laughs> to hold that over your head forever. <laughs> I could have fun if I didn't have a stupid kid and shit. Oh, no. Anyway. Um, no, but don't you think that that is also an element of, that when you are in... Uh, when especially when you're in a, a long-term relationship, when you've tried to start a life with somebody, that you do kind of get so caught up in the minutia and the day-to-day, and you do kind of have this thing where your brain just kind of like, when you're trying to multitask, your brain goes, good, that thing's under control. I have this person, yeah. this person, and then you have to make that time to sort of go, no, we need to go have a date night, or we need to make time to just be 
you know, like it's 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 wonderful to find another human being with whom you can just sit around uh, wearing sweatpants uh, all the time and just like I don't know watching the Mandalorian uh, and and stuff. Oh, yeah. But every once in a while, you have to make an effort. You have to remind yourself of. Of right, this I fell in love with this person for a reason, and this person fell in love with me for a reason, and and let's go have fun, let's go out on the town, let's go have a moment, let's go, uh, you know, I'll go get the barber to give me a manicure and a shave, and we'll, you know, we'll take on the town. Like that's something you kind of have to do. Yeah, but still, they don't have to do that. He just decides in the dead of night, like I'm gonna drown my wife, and I'm gonna use these sticks to survive. So I, I, I get what you're saying about like, oh, you have to have a date night, blah, blah, blah. But he just straight up like, hey, wife, I know you're busy. Uh, do you want to come out on the water? And she's like, yes, I'll put on my best clothes. And she does that. And he tries to drown her. And then he doesn't. And everything gets overshadowed by that. So when they were making up and they were in the church and the people were getting married and I'm like, oh, I was like, okay, of course you're making up because you're not thinking about what the hell happened to that dog. He tried to jump, jump in the boat. I guess he's there for a reason because it's 1927. Are there sheep to herd? I don't know. Are there animals? You're living on a farm. How do you survive? Who is that lady taking care of my child? I don't know. I guess we're good friends. But it gets overshadowed by the fact that my husband tried to drown me. And now we have to make up. Oh, but I think that it's, again, I don't think it's a literal drowning so much as, yes, he, he you know, in, in this, in the, if you're taking the film literally, he tried to, you know, to drown her. But I think it's more the idea of, you know, it's it's supposed to map onto those moments where one of us, you know, any of us have a moment of weakness and we have to get back to remembering why we were with this person to begin with and, and, and what that was all about, you know. They don't remember who the person they were with to begin with. They go out and have a grand old time with pigs and dancing and stuff. But you mentioned the church, and I think that that's the thing, is when they're at that church and they're watching this young couple get married, they kind of have this memory of, that was us once. Like, we were that couple once. And it's, you know, it, it's easy to, uh, you know, if you are settled into something, if you are, you know, a, a grown-up now, uh, to look at uh, other people who are out being young and exciting and, you know, nowadays scroll through your Instagram and see, well, maybe not right now, uh, at least here in America. I don't know if you guys have gotten it sorted yet, but over here we can't leave our houses. Um, we have to wear masks. It's a hellscape. Everything's terrible. Um, every day I'm afraid. But you used to, like, you'd scroll through your Instagram and see, like, other people are out having fun, and you'd be like, oh, God, maybe, you know, if I gotta ditch this this stuffy situation and, and move on to something else, and I could be young and hip again. I can get a sports car and an earring like Ted Danson in that season of The Good Place. Like, I could do this stuff. And then, and for them to look at the wedding and to kind of just have that moment of, you know, recognizing, right, we've lost touch with with what we had. And they, over the course of the film, they get back to that. They, they find that. And I think that that culminates in the ending that we haven't really addressed, which is, you know, the storm comes and he thinks she's drowned. And he's torn apart by this, you know, even though that was the thing that at the start he wanted and at the start the woman of the city, you know, was pushing for. And then she shows up and he uh, tries to strangle her the same way he tried to strangle uh, his wife earlier. Um, so you got that parallel. But I think that because she's a vampire. What is Sorry. her end game if she's a vampire? Is she planning on killing him? Is that your implication? No, here? she just goes on to another... I don't know, slave, person, familiar. So you think you think it's more of a let the right one in situation? Yes. Yeah. Oh, now Tom's on board for the theory. <laughs> now, now Tom's in. <laughs> no, but I still, like, I can't shake the feeling. I guess that's what, like, three years of film school does to you. But I just, I, I wholly believe 
that she is a force of evil. Not necessarily a vampire, but a force of evil. There I'm with you. A hundred percent. She's meant to represent temptation. The fact that she's specifically from the city and, and how uh, how wild and loose things are in the city. Um, or how I should clarify how they used to be in the city. Uh, as Tom and I can attest, having worked in Brooklyn for a long time, uh, it's not like that anymore. It's just it's just a lot of craft beers and people stoically uh, vaping. That's all it is and now. Kickstarters. God and damn. It's just it's like a more boring version of Search Party, the real Brooklyn. It's just it's a bleak place. And this kind of was hinted at a bit in the beginning, but of course it's accrued a lot of accolades. Uh, obviously, in the uh, inaugural induction class for the National Film Registry, one of the very few silence that gets in. Uh, was ranked in the top 10 of the Sight and Sound Critics Poll in 2002 and 2012. Uh, it was on the American Film Registry's list of uh, 100 Years, 100 Passions, rated number 63. It was on their revised 10th anniversary list of the 100 movies, ranked at number 2. The Woman from the City was even nominated for their 100 Heroes and Villains list. They did not clarify whether she was a vampire or not on that. At the Oscars... It was uh, nominated alongside The Crowd, uh, the King Vidor film we've invoked and covered on this show before, and Chang, which, uh, as we discussed previously on this show, is Marion C. Cooper's film that he made prior to King Kong. It's an experimental documentary narrative hybrid. Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans won the award for uh, Unique and Artistic Picture. Janet Gaynor also won Best Actress for this film, as well as Seventh Heaven and Street Angel, two films directed by Frank Borsage from that year. Weirdly, I can say that I think of the three films, Janet Gaynor is best in Street Angel, despite Street Angel being the worst of those three films. Uh, Sunrise was also nominated for Best Art Direction, but it lost to two films, uh, The Dove, which I have not seen because it's missing. Uh, I'm, maybe Mary Duncan lost it. Um, and... <laughs> Let's just, can we make a pact that any time we have to talk about a lost film, we just blame it on her, Tom? No matter what it is, it's just I mean, her fault. She's just, she just <laughs> keeps losing film prints. I mean, she's, she's just got to get better at it. Like, put, put, a, put a bell on the film prints and then you'll, you'll hear them when you drop them. You'll be like, oh, I dropped the film print again. Mary, Mary, did you borrow, borrow our last copy of London After Midnight? Eh, don't worry about it. Um, oh, Mary, I wanted to watch Napoleon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, uh, best art direction, so it lost to The Dove and a movie called Tempest. Uh, and I love the art direction in this film. I wish I could compare it to The Dove. And it was nominated for Best Cinematography, which it won. The only other thing of note Oscar-wise with that uh, is that Best Actor that year went to Emil Jannings for The Wave of All Flesh and The Last Command. Jannings had previously worked with Murnau as the star of his film, The Last Laugh. But so Sunrise not only uh, won the first ever Best Actress Award, sharing it with other films, and the first ever Best Cinematography, but won the only ever Oscar for Best Unique and Artistic Picture. Uh, how it was, the Academy eventually decided that the award that Wings won should technically be Best Picture instead of Sunrise. I don't know. I think that Sunrise has certainly... Uh, endured longer as a as a film in the popular consciousness and in the critical consciousness rather than Wings, though I don't dislike Wings. But well, Wings did at least have a good uh, long running TV show. <laughs> God damn it! God damn it! Oh, Mary no. Duncan, I wanted to watch the original <laughs> version of A Star Is Born. What are you doing? This was good. you cut out you. Uh, there was two extra dance scenes that I wanted to see, but now I gotta see the shorter version. God damn it, Mary! You know what? I'll forgive your ambitions. I'll forgive you. I'll forgive you that Murnau movie. You know Murnau, whatever. He's a German. I don't trust him. But like, god damn it, I wanted to see the longer three-hour version of the 1950s Star Wars Born. Fuck, Mary! I just wanted to see it. <laughs> what are you doing? Fuck, Mary! <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> there is no better way to wrap up this episode on that than on that note. So, with that, Chrissy Sire, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for for talking to us again. It has been so long. Do you have yeah, anything please. you want to plug on your way out? Yeah. 
Uh, the woman from the city is straight up a vampire. <laughs> That's your plug. Great. Thank you, everybody. I guess the only thing I'll say, uh, in addition uh, with my thoughts about Sunrise is just how I've noticed that a lot of the movies uh, in this uh, initial year, uh, relatively earlier films, tend to be more approachable. So even though people might have a harder time uh, talking about movies now, I do feel like when we approach things like, uh, you know, even Intolerance, uh, Modern Times, Nanook of the North, um, even with like just minor context, a lot of these movies you can um, approach without any real understanding of film outside of uh, suspending your disbelief. Just thought this sort of added to that theme. I think it's interesting. Part of the thing with these films, and again, it's, you know, uh, is that because you could only do, you know, because you were telling stories visually, you had to rely on more base ideas. You know, and those things became more. You couldn't do uh, to even to think about comedy or something like that. Like it's it's so hard for comedies to translate now because they rely so much on on wordplay or dialogue, humor, you know, things like that that don't really translate. But there's so much when you're doing a you're doing physical storytelling that kind of registers with every. I mean, like if you if you go to see a ballet, right? For example, I don't know how often any of us are going to the ballet, but if you go to the ballet you're going to get the exact same story and understand it the exact same amount that someone in France is going to get or someone in Germany is going to get or someone in Japan or Italy is going to get because there is no language. You're all just interpreting the same thing from movement and those movements are are, are a universal language, right? So to wrap up like we usually do, uh, what films did you guys include in the registry? Remember, it must be an American film that's at least 10 years old. Okay, so for me this week, um, I latched on to the... Uh unsurprisingly the crime aspect of this the fact that the guy's going to comes pretty close to killing his wife for another lady that comes close to it uh things go in a completely different direction and things end on a pretty happy note uh so i want i i kind of was looking at movies with that kind of story if not necessarily the killing aspect but the tainted love triangle kind of thing and I pretty quickly came to this movie that I'm surprised, very really surprised is not in the registry at this point, from a pair of filmmakers that are pretty iconic. They have, I think, at least one or two movies in the film registry at this point. Um, it's a movie about a tainted love triangle. It is a more of a noir than a, uh, a resurgent love story. Uh, and it's a movie where the plot is set into motion and murder is afoot and murder happens. This is not a movie where the good, the good guy, the good things happen. This is a movie where the bad uh, comes to play and the fallout from that uh, is dealt with in these filmmakers. Typically, wry, dark, funny, fucked up way. Uh, it's blood simple. I'm very surprised this isn't in. It's uh, the first movies from the Coens, le uh, already legendary directors, icon icons. One of the best debuts, uh, at least of the last 40 years, if not just in general, uh, of the auteur era, where it's not just studio filmmaking. Some guy gets a job and shoots the script. Uh, this is a pretty great movie. It's got a criterion kind of a good indicator of what these guys would go on to do but also not because they then followed up with raising arizona which you do not get from blood simple but i think it's a pretty great look at of a love triangle leading to horrible tragic circumstances and uh in the way that only those two uh maniacs from michigan could do uh i think it's pretty great it's I think it should be in the film industry. I'm I'm genuinely surprised it's not. Maybe it will be when we find out whenever the fuck they announce it this year. But my pick is Blood Simple. So for me, there was part of me that thought about that the same way. I was kind of on the same wavelength as Tom for a little bit, uh, which kind of led me to a very different film, which is Crimes and Misdemeanors. But um, but then I started thinking about it, and I started thinking about uh, certain elements, uh, both. The idea of this film uh, being a protagonist struggle with a with a temptress character, particularly a you know a dark haired, uh, pale skinned temptress, uh, right? That and also the power of images uh, and the allure of images that this film 
contains within it and and is itself. Um, so my pick is is less about necessarily matching it thematically so much as as, as what the film means and what it says to me. Uh, you know, when you look at the there's such a mystery to it. You're so drawn in, whether it's these the the close ups on uh, George O'Brien's face or Janet Gaynor or you know so you you're so absorbed by it. I say all that to say that the the film that that came to mind for me about that that has a similar theme in in terms of the temptation yet is a radically different film and also is about being the allure of the silent image. I was thinking about a film that I adore uh that I happened to see for the first time a couple years ago and I think is just exceptional and I do not understand how it is uh, another one words I don't understand how it's not in the registry. Um, but for the fact that, quite frankly, the film world and film academia is is uh, not great with recognizing female filmmakers, n- n- even worse with recognizing black female filmmakers, even worse recognizing black gay female filmmakers. But if you are a film lover uh, of any kind and you are drawn in by some uh, Cheryl Dunye's film, The Watermelon Woman is extraordinary it's the story of a it's a young black lesbian who works in a video store and she is simultaneously in a relationship with this dark-haired white woman temptress who is uh not the best match for her we'll put it that way uh to spare some people some spoilers and she's also drawn in by this silent film actress this black silent film actress uh who is only identified as the watermelon woman and it's about her navigating her own life and her own struggles while simultaneously trying to get more information on this mysterious uh, woman on the silent screen. It's a remarkable testament to the power of old cinema and the allure of old cinema and how we can take these old images, these almost hundred-year-old images, and still find relevance in them to our own lives, just as we did uh, you know, with this film today, and just as many people are doing with, with uh, the silent films that we're discussing i i think again watermelon is absolutely extraordinary and and absolutely deserves uh, a place in the registry thank you for listening and thanks to chrissy sire for joining us be sure to follow our co-hosts on social media where you can find mike at nkoas and tom at raging bull 1990 while you're there be sure to follow the show on twitter and instagram at ymo podcast If you like what you heard, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It really helps a little show like ours. If you know some friends who might like the show, tell them about it. And if you have someone you think would make a great guest for an upcoming film, tell us about it at yourmissingoutpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you again next time.